Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, where food bloggers come to get their fill of the latest tips, tricks, and insight into the world of food blogging. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll provide you with the tools you need to add value to your blog, and we'll also ensure you're taking care of yourself because food blogging is a demanding job. Now, please welcome your host, Megan Porta. As food bloggers, we want the best, most robust tools that can help us improve our ranking with Google. SEMrush is the way to go. It is an all-in-one marketing toolkit for those of you wanting to analyze SEO, get ideas for gaining more organic traffic, discover market insights, and reveal competitors' metrics. I have been using SEMrush for my own blog and have seen steady growth in my organic traffic. The tools and features offered inside are powerful and they work. Get a 14-day free trial with SEMrush when you use my affiliate link. Visit eatblogtalk.com forward slash resources to grab your link. SEMrush, the powerful tool that will change your SEO game. What's up, food bloggers? Welcome to the Eat Blog Talk podcast made for you, food bloggers who are seeking value for your blogs and for your lives. In today's episode, I will be talking to Jinju Lee from Kimchi Marie, and we will be discussing food blogging for the long haul. Jinju's site is a Korean food recipe site with detailed and exact recipes to help anyone cook them at home. She shares in-depth information about Korean cooking ingredients, including articles on differences between Korean and U.S. beef and pork cuts, how to ripen kimchi properly, and much more. She also provides historical and cultural background information about certain dishes because food and culture just go together. As a long hauler myself, this topic speaks to me, Jinju. But before we dive into it, give us a quick fun fact about yourself. Sure. Hi. So I'm so excited to be here. And the fun fact about me is that um, I'm a diplomat's kid. I actually grew up in India for about four or five years during my middle school years. And uh, although I have like four older sisters and brothers, um, they were all back in Korea and I was all by myself, so I was lonely. So I had two German Shepherds, a Lhasa Apso, nine fishes, two parakeets, and a guinea pig. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so can you tell I love animals? Yeah. And then the one last crazy thing is I also went horseback riding there, but over there at that time, so this is like late 70s, there's no stables or arena. We just get on the horse and they just take you out into the open field oh, in the wow. line. But these horses, I later realized, are kind of half trained. So if you don't know what you're doing, sometimes the horses will just turn around and start running back to their stables. So the first thing you learn oh is how to stop them from doing that. You learn pretty quickly. Oh, yes. And so I fell a few times. And now that I think about it, it, it was a good thing my mom didn't know the exact situations. Oh. <laughs> she would have never left. Sometimes it's best when our parents don't know exactly what's going on until later, right? <laughs> That's so interesting. So do you have a love for animals still today? Yes, I do. I uh, Right now, I just have one uh, crazy rescue dog. But yeah, I've always had a dog. And, um, and you know, I, I had my daughter get into horseback riding, which I kind of regretted after a while because I did not realize I would be monkey stalls while she rode. But no, it was it was all good. That's a great fun fact. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Now, if you're ready, let's get on to the reason you're here today. We're going to talk about food blogging for the long haul. So I was thinking beforehand, like how to start this. I'm like, you know that saying, life is a journey. I think food blogging is a journey should be a saying too, because it's there's such truth to that. I give huge pats on the back to food bloggers who manage to stick with it for more than, I don't know, five years, because... There are so many constant changes. There are so many different moving parts that we all need to be informed about at any given time. And also, it's easy to feel like such a teeny tiny fish in a massive ocean of other food bloggers. And that can just sink some of us. So, Jinju, I would love to start this discussion by just having you share a little bit about your own blogging journey and how that has evolved for you. I'm in my ninth year. I started back in 2010. Yeah, and it's been a journey in many different aspects. So for me, 
as a blogger, I started out not as a blogger, just somebody who's just testing the waters. I didn't even know if I had what it took. It was just at the suggestion of my daughter since I was having a midlife crisis and wanted to do something totally different. And she said, oh, why don't you, you know, you love cooking and why don't you start it? So I just did it as a hobby in the beginning. I had absolutely no confidence. I also didn't really take it seriously, too. I think that was the issue that went on for a couple of years. And then I actually had to go back to Korea for two and a half years. I didn't think I would be taking a break. But when I went to Korea, it was so hard to adjust back, even though I'm born and raised in Korea. But I lived in the States for, you know, over I guess, 20 years before I went back. So I changed so much. I had a hard time adjusting back. And so for two and a half years, I just basically did not blog because I didn't have any heart in it. I did want to continue at some point. So I actually spent the time to learn different things and, you know, learn more about Korean cooking. But then I came back and continued. But this time I decided I would do it professionally. I would take it seriously. I would do it as a business because that's what I realized I wanted to do. And when you don't do it seriously, people don't take you seriously, you know, and and if you don't prioritize, you know, before then it was always like, I take care of the family first, I help other people first, and then whatever time I have left, I would blog. And that just didn't, you know, work uh, in the long run. So, you know, in terms of a blogger, I think I went from a hobby blogger to a professional more, you know, full time. And then now I'm doing it as a business. Also, personally, I did go through, uh, you know, in Korea, the two and a half years, although I enjoyed a lot being with family and everything, um, it was kind of a hard time for me. I also had some, you know, illness and all of that. So yeah, in nine years, a lot of things happen, but um, I'm glad I just kind of hung in there. And for those of you thinking like you need a break, it's actually totally fine. If you take a break for a couple of years, the blog is still there. You can come back to it. You just need to, you know, realize that you did take a break and it's going to take some time to, um, you know, catch up with uh, everybody else. Yeah, because things change so rapidly. So I'm curious when you came back after your couple year break, what things had changed the most for you? Like what stood out the most as being like totally different? Oh, SEO. You know, when I started in 2010, I left in 2012. Nobody talked about SEO then. You know, we just my images were all named, you know, DSC underscore 1767. You know, so and keywords who, who I don't know, nobody talked about all of that stuff. So I just did it and, you know, did whatever I felt like doing. I had no idea you were supposed to do things a certain way. So that was a big, um, huge, and I'm still kind of, you know, I, I still have old posts that I really need to go back and change. But yeah, it was a big um, kind of a, you know, new shock for me when I came back. And then the other thing was, yeah, when I started, there was no experts that taught you how to blog. You know, everybody was just on their own. So when I came back, that that was good. I, I actually signed up with the Food Blogger Pro and learned about all the social media. That's the other thing. Before I went, you know, nobody really connected social media and blogging. And at that time, maybe there was Facebook. Yeah, there was Facebook, but all the other, you know, Instagram didn't exist and uh, Pinterest I'd never heard of, you know. When I came back, I had to do all that. And I actually had a bit of a resistance about, you know, doing all of it. It was just so overwhelming, you know, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook. And it's like, how is one person ever going to be able to take care of all of that? So, yeah, it was a big sort of a learning curve. And it was good that there were experts who, you know, could tell you how to get started, you know, what to do and all that stuff. Yeah, that's encouraging for people that are maybe thinking about taking a break, because I think that's one of the reasons we don't is because we think we're going to miss out on all of this stuff. And that when we come back into it, that it's just going to be like this explosion of new information. But I liked what you said. And this is encouraging for me. There are always new experts popping up. So if they Things do pop up, new things, like what if there's a new platform just around the corner? There are going to be experts that come along with it. So don't fret. I mean, back in the day when we started blogging, you and I, yeah, there, nobody know, knew anything because we were all just kind of waiting around trying to figure things out. But now it's so much different. There are experts in every single aspect of food blogging. And there are a lot of people that we can 
kind of lean on for those things. One thing I wanted to point out that you said that I loved, you said that your own thoughts kind of translate into how your business runs. So once you started taking things seriously, then your business became a more serious thing. And that is so true. I think a lot of us go through that same transformation where we're just kind of doing it on the sidelines and letting our schedule determine our blogs. But then when we make that decision to just do it the other way around and like, this is my business and I'm going to schedule things around that, then it's like the business takes itself seriously. Like, okay, finally you're you're taking this seriously. So I love that you pointed that out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think for me, what it was, was I wasn't confident or even kind of proud that I was a blogger. You know, it, it, it was still back then the time where if you say you're a blogger, they'll say, well, what is, what do you do? Do you make any money with that? You know, so that too. And so I felt if I wasn't a huge success already or wasn't making money, I kind of wasn't too confident to say, oh, you know, I have to work on my blog today. I can't see you for lunch today. You know, it was kind of embarrassed to even say that. So I would be dragged into different, you know, social or whatever um, events and or volunteering. And then my blog kept getting pushed back. And I got so frustrated one time because I realized this is like a vicious cycle and I need to break it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I um, say that. Yeah, that's great stuff. Thanks for sharing that about your journey. And now let's chat a little bit about mindset because with blog growth comes change. And with blog change, we have to adapt as well, or our blogging journeys will stop thriving. So what are some things to keep in mind as our blogs and lives grow? The first thing, as I just previously mentioned, is is I think the mindset that if you want it to be a business, then you got to take it seriously and um, make that a priority. The other thing is, I think blogging is actually a very long haul kind of a thing. Every now and then some people have instant success in maybe a couple of years. But a lot of the big bloggers that I know, uh, they have been doing it for many over seven, eight, you know, nine years. So because even though Internet is such an instant thing. I do realize each post, it needs time for it to gain popularity or gain enough, you know, social media numbers as Google likes to keep track of kind of, right? So it needs time for it to grow. So like Pulgogi was my very first post that I posted in 2010. And I when I was in Korea, I didn't do anything on my blog. But when I came back, it was like number one on Google and I didn't do anything about it. Yeah. But I think it was partly because I was one of the very early posts that, you know, nobody did bulgogi at that time. So that's part of the thing. Um, and then I guess the recipe was good. A lot of people actually really liked it and they kept sharing and all that stuff. So I think that's one thing. The other is don't try to follow the trend too much. I feel like, you know, people tend to panic when there's a new change in the algorithm or new new change in some social media, how they do it. Over this long period of time, what I realized is if you kind of stay true to your audience, what you really want to deliver, and you think about them before the algorithm or all the other stuff, I think sometimes even the social media catches up to your idea. Like I have this fun experience with Pinterest. If you remember maybe like three, four years ago, group boards was the thing, right? Everybody had to create group boards and share. And and um, at that time I was thinking, I don't know if I was the person visiting or following my Pinterest you know, account, would they enjoy seeing all these group boards with everything mixed in it, so much to filter through. So I decided then it's like, I don't know, I think I just want to pin mostly my stuff to my board. They can find other people's stuff elsewhere. So I just pin my own pins mostly to my board. And then recently, you know, Pinterest kind of like almost just kind of killed the group boards. And then now they're even talking about, you know, when you pin your new pins, you should pin to your own boards first. And they kind of, I can feel they kind of want to focus that way because there's just too much noise out there with all these pins being cross-pinned in different boards. And sometimes a person may see 20 same pins all pinned to different boards. That's one thing I kind of realized uh, worked for me. And then, you know, if 
Sometimes you feel like you're not growing at all and you feel stuck. Just just wait a while. Things will change. Or, I mean, you should try to learn what's changed and try to adapt. But I feel like we should not go crazy and try to change everything all at once because who knows, things may change again, you know? So just take it as it comes and, and you know, do what you can. You know, there's no way we can do everything all at once. Don't freak yeah, out. That's the main thing. <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah, it's good to be on top of what's going on and the changes. And there was just another huge Google update. And I know that's affected a lot of people. And I, it's so easy to just freak out at every little thing. But I'm getting to the point where I don't at all. I'm almost on the other end of the spectrum where everyone else is freaking out. And I'm like, you know what? Like we have we have done this for so long. It's going to be okay. They have really our best interest in mind. They're thinking about the user experience and that's the whole new big thing. And you mentioned this too, Jinju, is that if you just take a step back and look at what your audience is seeing and what they're needing from you, if we can just do that and truly focus on that every day that we're creating for them, it's just going to be okay in the long run. So I think there's no point in the freak out with that said, it is easy to freak out. To see those traffic drops, like sudden spikes and then sudden drops, uh, <laughs> it's not easy. Sometimes it changes back. Like I know a fellow uh, blogger who like lost 30, 40% of her traffic due to, was it the March update? And she was freaking out. But then by June or July, after they had another couple more minor ones, I think, she kind of recovered most of her traffic without doing too much. They they do try to make sense of things and they do realize maybe with one update, they missed you know certain parts and then they will try to fix that in the second update. I mean, you got to figure that they have millions of websites to crawl. So <laughs> that's a lot of information. So give them a little bit of a break. Not freaking out, not panicking is good. And then I just wanted to point this out. I love that you were looking at Pinterest and that you took a step back from just kind of like how you viewed your page and saw that are these group boards really valuable to anyone? Me circulating all of this other content? Because if someone truly goes to your Pinterest page they're probably there for a reason for you. Yeah. And that's kind of a fresh new perspective because we've always been told like circulate other people's pins. Um, what was like the 80, 20 rule? I think like do 80% yours, 20% others. So I did that for many, many years, but is it worthwhile? I don't know. So I like that you did that. I like that you saw that from a different perspective. I think that's really important when it comes to mindset. And then just to add to your mindset list, that's a great list, by the way. I think just like trying to stay positive on top of it all is really important, too. And I know it's hard in food blogging and just being an influencer in general. But with a positive mindset, I think comes finding that self-confidence in our abilities. And also it frees us from competition. And I believe that when we've found that place for ourselves, that's where we really start thriving as creative individuals. So I think just doing whatever you need to do to stay positive as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, and that's so hard, you know, and, and I think one thing that goes with that is not to be too micro minded is what I'm realizing, like, there are certain periods where I look at my traffic every day, or I'm signed up to SM Rush, and it sends me, you know how it sends you an email, something, a post dropped in rank or something. And every time you read that, it's like, oh my God, my blog is just like, you know, going down the pits, right? It's like, yeah, what's happening? Well, you know, what's going wrong? And then, you know, a few days later, or maybe a week later, it may say, oh, it went up again. It's like, what? You know, so I realized if we didn't look at it so closely over over or longer term it would eventually all go up but because they keep sending you all these little data bits you know you tend to, so these days i kind of like do i want to look at it today no i really don't so i'm not even going to look at it you have to be in the right mindset and i think there's definitely value in keeping current with what's going on with your numbers regularly but not too regularly like you said I like your word micro-minded because <laughs> I too get those emails from SEMrush where I'm like oh my gosh the sky's falling I mean it, they word it as if my website is literally about to explode and Google's about to kick me off of the face of the earth and at first I was like oh my gosh I remember I was outside last spring because that's when I signed up I was 
hanging out with my boys or having a good time. And I just looked at my phone and I saw one of those emails and I dropped my phone. I ran inside and my husband was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. Things are about to be really bad. And it was like ridiculous. I mean, I get them every week now and now I just ignore them. I know. Everything's really fine. not healthy either. <laughs> no, it's really not. I mean, I should be allowed to spend some time outside with my family without freaking out about one little yeah (laughs) but I like that you mentioned that I remember a couple years ago I used to sit on my couch and like just look at my analytics like for hours and how weird is that now I'm like I don't have time for that I do that a couple times a week just to see what's going on pop in and out and I don't let myself do it for more than a couple minutes why was I doing that? That was such a waste of my time and so counterproductive. I was just like obsessively like watching them go. Yeah, but it is so, so easy to kind of get addicted to it, kind of, you know, because you you see actual changes. And yeah, but yeah, I, um, I think it's just uh, so much better that you, you focus on stuff that you enjoy. Yeah, one day I realized you know, I enjoy developing recipes and cooking. I don't really enjoy looking at all these numbers every day, you know. So I decided I'll just look at it every now and then. And It's a rabbit hole. It can be a huge rabbit hole for me. So I have to be careful. So keeping up with the fast pace of the food blogging world can make our heads spin, at least for me it does. So talk to us about ways to keep up without losing our sanity. Yeah, so the first thing was, um, you know, not to be micro-minded. We already talked about that. And then I just felt over the years, you know, just like life, nothing is forever and a lot changes over time. So, you know, sometimes even platforms may disappear or, you know, they may go out of business and and new ones appear. So you just got to kind of step back a lot of times and just either be patient and let things, you know, take time or maybe look at it from a different point of view. And and then for me, yeah, the main thing was I realized you just got to view the platform from the view of an audience. What would be useful for them? Uh, how would they want to see it? Then the other thing is I realized get very sort of um, caught up with all the experts. You know, there's so many experts out there about, diff- you know, about Instagram, about SEO or whatever. But remember that they all kind of have an angle. The companies also, social media companies, they have an angle. Always notice if a company went IPO, I experienced that then they want to make money. So which means they want you to do ads. That's just a simple, simple thing. So if you do that, they they kind of put you at in a different tier, I feel like, and you get more exposure. You know, sometimes you got to do that, I think, to sort of be part of their nicer member list or whatever. And I think always use common sense when dealing with advices that these experts give you, you know, does it, it really make sense to you that you do certain things? If it doesn't, then maybe let wait around a while, let see what people say about it, if it has helped them or not, you know, with anything like, uh, because I'm a software engineer by trade, like software, I never upgrade to the latest one right away. I always wait around so that all the bugs are worked out. Yeah, everybody has time to complain and fix or whatever. And then I go in and do it. So that that is the trick with anything new, any software, any big change. Um, there, there will be bugs and fix that they'll need to make. So just give it time and, and then you can, you know, look at it uh, again. So yeah, and, and I think also... Don't be afraid to be different. I think in this fast changing world, if you try to follow all the advice out there, you can be just chasing and chasing and then not realizing what you're going towards sometimes, I think. And this kind of goes to my niche blogging, Korean food blog. I feel Google somehow treats these niche blogs different food blogs because I would be hearing all this advice about and this is actually a mistake I made. So bulgogi, I told you, remember, was n- number one when I came back. But then I started trying to get professional and learn all this SEO and everything. I kind of changed some things in there, trying to make it better because it started falling a little bit. So I changed and made it SEO friendly when actually before it wasn't at all. 
but it was number one. So what I feel like, and this is just kind of a gut feeling, I don't have any <laughs> evidence to back it up, but for um, post recipes that are where the numbers are not so many. Now there are a lot of bulgogi recipes, but back then there weren't so many. So Google, I think, tends to relax the SEO or all those things that they being count on. You know, if it's a good recipe, share it. You know, they'll uh, put it high up in ranking, even though like SEO sucks, right? But once you touch it, then I started dropping and I still haven't recovered in a way. So if you if you have if you're doing well and you're in a small niche blog, I would be very careful about doing SEO stuff, you know, do it minimally and see how it affects, because I think it affects us differently than some of the, you know, just uh like, you know, non-niche, you know, bigger uh, cuisine blogs. Isn't it kind of creepy to think that Google might know us so well that they know when we're following our guts? Because I, I too have a few recipes that way back when they literally just killed it right away. It was my chili recipe and my meatloaf recipe and my goulash recipe. And I did not have anything that was SEO friendly in any of those posts, but they were all within the top three spots on the first page on Google. And then at the advice of somebody, I went in and changed a bunch of stuff to make them, quote, SEO friendly. And I lost them. And I've never, like you, I have never regained that. I've gotten close and I've tweaked them over time, but it's taken years and I'm still not back there. So there really is something to that. Just kind of listening to your gut about certain things and don't always go with every single thing that the experts are telling you. There is a little element of intuition here. And I think there's nothing like set in stone that you can follow. But just like going with your gut on those really popular recipes that maybe you're really passionate about or that just killed it right away for whatever reason, like your recipe as well. Um, but yeah, there's definitely an element of magic that I feel like Google tapped into. And then when I got rid of the magic, they noticed that and they're like, sorry. <laughs> I kind of think like our older post, Google maybe looked at it at whatever their standard was back then. And then since it became number one, they just kind of left it. But once we touch it, I think they come back and look at it again, right? Because they need to re-index it. So when they do that, I think now we are evaluated with a different standard. I think that may be part of it. And, you know, and after all, all these experts, they don't work inside Google, you know, they're outside of Google. So I feel like a lot of them are kind of guesses. You And again, we don't know if it applies to everybody. It may apply for some, but not, you know, certain, uh, yeah, style or certain niche. Here's another thing someone brought to my attention recently is that we hear so much advice from SEO experts who are not bloggers and they're very technically minded and they're very smart and they know so much, but it's very rare that you hear actual SEO advice from an actual blogger. So I recently did an interview with Emma Christensen from Simply Recipes and I've gotten so much feedback about her episode because she is a blogger and she's in the world of blogging, but she's also an SEO expert. So advice from those people is so valuable because they actually know both sides. Oh, I so better check that out. Yeah. You for sure should. She has such a, just a different perspective that you wouldn't hear from anyone yeah. else. It just rang true with a lot of people, myself included. So if you haven't listened to that, definitely do it. First of all, Jinju, did you have anything else to add to that? Just keeping up with the fast pace of blogging, if you had anything else to add to that list. You know, I kind of went in a way anti don't keep up too much. But then I, I think definitely you do need to be part of, you know, certain I get a lot of help from joining, you know, Facebook groups like the Food Blogger Central or um, because I'm an ad thrive, I'm in the hashtag Jeff's Facebook group. And so uh, in these places, you can read what other people ask and you, you know, you can get advice, you know, you can ask questions. So there you can keep up with because otherwise you can't be reading search engine news all the time or whatever. But uh, that's the best way to keep up and just but filter, you know, don't don't act upon every advice that comes along, but but at least read about it, know about it and see if it's, 
if something's changing on your end, and then you could, you know, try and experiment. But I think, yeah, it's always important to remember that it may apply to you differently. So it is always good to just change a little bit, see the response, and then uh, maybe go site wide if it's something you think you need to do. Great advice. And I think sit on it a little bit too. There's so much information out there. People are so willing to share their valuable thoughts. So take it. I mean, listen to it, of course. But before you go and like rewrite your top 10 posts completely, maybe sit on it and just give it some thought. So I think that is really good advice. Okay, Jinju, let's move on just a little bit and switch gears. Give us your very best advice for those times when we just feel stuck in food blogging. We've all been there. If we've been in the game for a year or five or 10, we've been there and it can be a really discouraging place to be. So what is your best advice for us during those times? There are several reasons why you're stuck. I think if you're stuck because you just feel uninspired and, you know, kind of have no ideas, <laughs> a great way is to just pull your audience and, and get ideas from there. I do giveaways a lot uh, because I truly want to share a lot of Korean goods, you know, Korean like grill pans that a lot of people cannot get. So I don't do a lot of sponsored giveaways because it's a lot of work, but I just buy stuff and what it costs twenty five dollars, you know, forty dollars or whatever. And I give them away. And every time I do it, I'm so surprised because the response that people give me, they can just say, oh, just enter me. I want this. You know, sometimes in the past I have asked for, can you give me your top recipe or give me an idea what I should do next? You know, I will ask or tag a friend, you know, do things like that. But recently what I did is I, I said, you know, just tell me whatever you want to tell me. And I just trust that you'll share my recipes with your friend if you enter this. Because I realize by now I have so many, it's too time consuming for me to check if they actually, you know, shared it. Like, And yeah, first of all, the other thing, which also goes to my other point, you can be stuck also because you feel like, oh, you know, nobody likes my blog. You know, nobody seems to even appreciate it. We get into that rut too, right? We need some love back. When I do this, they suddenly, all of a sudden comment with how they love you know, my recipes, how they actually made it for a friend or, you know, made it for their parents and their parents were so pleased. So all of a sudden they share all these things that I didn't know happened un until, right, they shared it. So for me, it has been giving me such energy whenever I do these giveaways, because for me, just reading all those wonderful comments is inspiration enough for me to continue and then the other thing is yeah when I ask then they can give you oh I want this or you know can you make a recipe for this so that's another way that oh I realized oh there's like recently people have been asking about Korean pastries you know it, it is like bread and but I did like a milk bread you know the Japanese milk bread different from the regular bread that we you know uh, eat here so somebody asked for that and I developed the recipe for that. And so that was a lot of fun. It was something different. Korean food by nature, we don't do, you know, uh, the authentic cuisine doesn't have any baking in there. But, you know, these days, modern times, Koreans love bread. So I find that's actually a great way to get unstuck, also get ideas, but also get some love back and you get encouraged and you feel energized and you realize it is actually very helpful and worthwhile to a lot of people. And it's nice to just know that you're not alone, <laughs> that there are people actually following along with your content on social media, on your blog, because it's such a lonely job and we do a lot of our work from home by ourselves so often I feel like it's just me, but it's good to know that people are out there. And I found Instagram particularly helpful for this because of the polls. Because when I do a poll about food or whatever the topic is, just seeing the re responses, I'm like, oh, I didn't even know you were there. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful. Like, thank you so much for taking the time to answer it. And then this is another strategy that I started based on some advice I got about Instagram a while ago. Just trying to get people to engage on posts. Like if you want this recipe, so instead of including the recipe in the Instagram post, say like leave a comment with this if you want the recipe. So I started doing that 
And so many people were reaching out and they're like, yes, I want the recipe. Whereas before, I had no idea how many people were grabbing the recipe and enjoying it. But this way, I feel validated like, okay, there is a point in your work. You are actually providing value to these people by giving them a great recipe. So I think whatever you can do to find ways to like get people to engage with you. Quick question. That's so interesting. Yeah. So do you send them the recipes individually to them or? So I'm going to give you an example. So I just posted a an instant pot turkey breast recipe. And I just said like, you know, if you are slimming it down for Thanksgiving this year, you're not having a big crowd and you want just a little bit of turkey that's cooked perfectly, let me know and I will send you the recipe. Leave me a drumstick in the comments or whatever. People would leave drumsticks in the comments and then once a day, I would just take that recipe, I would copy it and then it would, it takes like a minute. I would just like click the name, send message, paste. Mm -hmm. Click the names, message, paste. What so is extra work, but it's like, first of all, you're putting a name and a face to the people who are consuming your content. And then also you're upping engagement mm -hmm. and you're like helping out with that right, whole game. Right. So it's just been a way for me to connect with people and to see who exactly is liking my stuff. And it's been really great. But again, it's like, you know, an extra step where you actually have to like copy and paste yeah I think that's great and and they feel you you are at a, a lot more personal level I mean that kind of brings me to this little point so I started a Facebook group a couple years ago and I tried to be in there answer questions um, interact as much as I can and uh, the people there keep saying that Oh, you know, we just love how accessible you are, how you actually respond to our questions, because so many bloggers don't answer back. But also I get a lot in return. They they tend to give me appreciation so much more in the group than on a page. I don't know why. But so, yeah, I'm finding the group sort of I, I feel like they're sort of my my fan club, really, because, yeah, and and you you do get so much love back, which is which is really great. People really do appreciate when you take just those couple of seconds to make a personal reply. And every time I send a recipe on Instagram, most people write back, thank you. Wow. Some people who have never done it before are like, wow, thanks for the response. And I always reply to that too and just say, you're welcome anytime because I want people to know that I'm human. I don't have a VA monitoring all of my stuff. I am here partially, you know, I'm here um, somewhat. So I want people to know that I'm real and that I'm genuine and I really do want you to enjoy my recipes. So I think it's a matter of like, I like that you found that Facebook group. That's great. And you are providing value to people and you said that you're getting value back. That's so true because our readers and our audience really do give us so much back. I do have one last thing. So, and then the, I think the other reason why sometimes we get stuck is because I think sometimes we just want to, I don't know, at least for me, I want to, I want to do something different. I, I want to do not what's the next smart recipe to do, but a recipe that I just feel like doing and sharing. So um, I feel like sometimes we should not worry too much about, you know, what is the smart SEO recipe thing to do or, you know, what would people like most, but sometimes you just got to do it for yourself, you know, what you want to enjoy. So I, every now and then I would just post about my garden, you know, what I grow and how they look, how I use it or whatever. And in the beginning, I was like, so unsure. It's like, this is not a recipe. What if like people complain to me, you know, this is, this is not worthwhile. But I said, you know what, I just feel like doing it today. I don't feel like posting a recipe. So I would do it. And I would be happy. And and there would be at least few people who are really appreciated. Of course, I got yelled at later by SEO experts saying that's thin content, and you need to get rid of it. And I did after a few years. But at least at that time, I felt good about it. You know, I feel sometimes we just got to do what makes us feel good. Don't worry about all the expert advice or tips or stuff that you were supposed to do. Yes. I mean, most of the time it's good to keep that stuff in mind, but once in a while it's good to get creative, let your creative juices flow, whatever that means for you and focus on what fills you with passion. I think writing about your garden once in a while is totally fine. I think that's actually good and healthy. All right, let's move on to 
just being in the game for a while, like you have, Jinju, I know you've got some great tips in addition to what you've already shared with us. What are some lessons that you've learned along the way, maybe the hard way, (laughs) that could benefit the rest of us? Share with us some of your lessons that have turned into knowledge and growth for you. So the biggest hard lesson that I learned in the beginning, once I decided I wanted to make my blog into, you know, a business, I realized I was doing WordPress.com blog for, I don't know, good three years or whatever. And um, so I realized I had to go to a self-hosted version, WordPress.org. And when I tried to do that, my blog was already kind of too big. It wasn't a small, you know, I had a lot of recipes on it. And then I was searching for hosting companies. I searched for best hosting company for WordPress or something like that, right? And you get these bunch of blogs recommending hosting companies. And I I read it and it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. So I tried hosting company A. It was terrible. They messed things up. And then at the end, they said, oh, we can't migrate it because you're too big. And so then I was so frustrated. And that happened with hosting company A and B. And then I realized, wait a minute, these these companies can't be this bad, but people are recommending it. (laughs) And then I actually searched for negative comments about those companies. And oh, yes, there were tons of of posts that said, don't ever go to this company. So I realized, you know, there are certain bloggers who are just doing it for the business. They're affiliates and they just, you know, want to make money and they're not really doing authentic review right so that so I went through one two companies so much headache Um, in the end they just couldn't do it Um, I even paid them like separate money to do custom migration that still didn't work properly I think when you um, look for new tools or companies or whatever make sure you search for both positive and negative comments and then of course also and at that time I didn't I wasn't part of this, you know, Facebook groups with other bloggers, so I couldn't ask the question back then. But if you can do that, of course, that's the best. But but even that, you know, some people may have some different reason why they're recommending it. So you just don't know. So I think it's just good to do both. And I think this is a good reason. It's good for all of us to hear because it's a good reminder that as bloggers, we should only back services that we and products that we truly stand behind. Because for that reason, like if we're getting paid to put out a review on something we've never even used before, how does anyone know that? <laughs> so that's a really good point and something that I I never thought of, especially starting out. If you Google best hosting, then you just assume that people are being honest. How do you recommend? Okay, so you went from finding all these positive reviews, having a bad experience, And then you had the thought, okay, I'm going to look for negative reviews. And then did you just find an onslaught of just bad comments? No, there were actually blog reviews that said negative things about these hosting companies. Yeah. So it's like, oh, I should have searched for that also. I only search for, you know, Google will give you results for only what you search for. So... So if you don't search for, you know, what's bad hosting company to go to, you know, it wouldn't give you that result, right? And another good reason also to have a good network of food bloggers that you trust and know and can rely on for information like this. Yeah, definitely. And then, so what I did was I actually went to one of the successful big bloggers and um, usually at the bottom, it will show the hosting company uh, that hosts that site. So I, that's how I found my uh, hosting company that I'm still with, WOPT. I, you know, I looked it up and most people were with, with that company. It's like, oh, there must be something to this, right? <laughs> so I contacted him and, and he just, you know, solved everything for me. He he did it with no issue. And I was like, I can't believe. And, and for less money too, so. Well, that's great. I'm glad that you found sound advice and that you found someone you love. So give us some other lessons you have learned over the years. I think it's a big one. I For, for a time, I, I kept comparing myself to other more successful bloggers and just being frustrated and being unhappy and being envious, you know, and that's just uh, so much of, I mean, we all know, bloggers all know that, and we we all suffer through it. And, and then we also try to do everything that everybody else is doing. 
So like for a while, I really tried to get into video. But for me, it was taking way too long. And it was just so stressful. And then so a few months ago, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to try to make the most professional, awesome looking video. I'm just going to not focus on that too much. Things got a lot less stressful. And then I decided, but, and that's not my strength. So my strength is elsewhere and I'm going to use that. And I was talking to this friend who's a college counselor. I was telling her, you know, I decided I'm not going to go try to do that or like kill myself doing it. And she goes, you know, I always tell my students, don't try to compete with others with your weaknesses. You compete with others with your strengths. And it's like, exactly. That is what I should have been thinking, you know, although I still do video, but I just found a simpler way to do it. And I'm not going to try to make it all. I kind of have a perfectionist side. So I, that was my problem. I was trying to make it perfect with perfect lighting and color and everything. And it was just taking way too much time. So, um, So that's uh, something that I decided. And it was so liberating to, and like social media too, you know, I decided, you know, out of all that, I seem to be doing well in some uh, like Facebook group, Pinterest, but, you know, there may be others that I'm not so good at. And it's like, well, then I'm not going to stress too much about that for whatever reason. Maybe I'm just not right for that platform or I just don't have time to learn all the tips and tricks because each social media platform has a different tips and tricks that we're supposed to do to grow. Right. And it was just like, (laughs) so, yeah, we can't do it all. I mean, there are so many different parts of it, so many different moving parts that it's just not realistic to jump in, assuming that we're going to be able to nail all of it. So I think it's really important, like you mentioned, Jinju, just focusing on what our strengths are and really building on those and not worrying so much about what our weaknesses are. Because like you said, we don't compare ourselves to others based on our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That's silly. We compare based on what our strengths are and grow from there. Do you have anything else that you've learned along the way that you think might be helpful for younger food bloggers or anyone listening today? Be patient, be generous to yourself. Remember, for most of us, this is a long game. Overnight success happens every now and then in a couple of years. Some amazing, you know, luck has something to do with it too, I think. Yeah, know that it's going to take a while. But the good thing is, I think when it takes you longer to build up, I feel like you are more sustainable too, because it wasn't something because something just one thing went viral and all of a sudden you're big um you you have a lot of good recipe posts that have built up traffic for you over the years and they're not going to go away overnight yeah i think overall it's just good to just stay in there and just think of it like you're going to a, you know office every day you're just going to work every day and you do what you can that day you shouldn't stress too much about oh, I should have done all of this by, you know, end of this month and I haven't and I'm such a terrible blogger, you know. I just want to point out one thing that you said that I really liked, the overnight success thing. It does happen. Occasionally we see those bloggers who just figure it out right away and I think there is an element of luck involved. And I just want to say that just to keep that in mind that it's not the norm and that when you see those people, don't let it upset you. And instead, like celebrate them. That's awesome. I'm so happy every time I see a blogger come in and just like kill it right away. I think that's amazing. How amazing is that? But it's not the norm. It's not typical. So don't assume that just because they can do it or that they did it, that you can that you should be doing it because your story is completely different than their story. So just try to stay the course. And like Jinju said, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And you want to be in it for the long haul because I believe there's such value in doing it for a long time and building up community and knowledge over a long span of time as well. And also, I think if you treat it too much as a business right from the get-go and you have these goals and bam, 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 you want to do it. I think you tend to lose a lot of the, you know, the personal relations or, you know, the, the feedback that you get or the relationships, the bond that you have with your audience. I think um, that can sort of get lost because you're so busy. I mean, I think that's why some bloggers don't have 
they they don't respond to comments because they may think, okay, that's is that worth my time and money? No, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm going to focus on you know putting a more post or something. I think that way you can burn out more easily. I feel like because if you have that audience, the real group of people that are true fans of yours, then you know you're doing it for these people, even though sometimes the traffic may go down and you feel like uh, you know everything's lost. But you know those people are still there and they're you know encouraging you to go on. So I because yeah, I get as you said at the beginning, this can be such a lonely um, sort of a uh, disconnected kind of a job you feel like because you are not at an office, tar- you're having coffee with your fellow workers, you're by yourself all the time. So I, I do realize having that sort of connection with your audience is important in so many ways. Oh, I totally agree. So to wrap up, I'm just going to point out a few of my absolute favorite things that you said during our chat. So we've covered, you know, this is a long game and go into it knowing that it's probably going to be a long haul for you and just be settled with that. I think the more settled you are, the more successful you're going to be and the happier you're going to be. Just stay in tune with your audience. Stay true to what they want from you and constantly be looking for ways to just see your business from their perspective. I think that was a really good point you made. Also, Jinju and I talked about this a little bit, not to freak out about the little things, the the dips in traffic, et cetera. Just try to see it as a bigger picture instead of letting those little things upset you and bring you down. Always listening to what people are wanting from you and needing from you. Just keep your ears open all the time. Comparison, try your best to stay away from comparison. I know it's so, so hard. And then I love what you said toward the end, Jinju. Be generous to yourself. I think that is a huge point that we all miss in this food blogging world. And we're so hard on ourselves. We wonder why we can't do it all, why we can't do more, why we're not doing it like XYZ. Just taking the time to be generous and have grace with ourselves is a huge part of it. So thank you for mentioning that too. Is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye, Jinju? So much good stuff here. One thing that I learned in terms of comparing yourself to others, I actually struggle with this a lot for about a year. Um, And then I realized, you know what, I wasn't being fair to the other successful bloggers. You know, sometimes when we're envious or jealous, I think there's a part in there where we feel like, but my recipes are better than that you know, theirs, right? But I went and looked at their blogs more carefully or how they did it. And I realized, you know what, they deserve that success because I'm sure they worked just as hard or maybe even harder than I did. Plus, there is a, you know, there's a part that people seem to really like. Maybe it's simpler, you know, maybe um, they have more uh, photos or so, Um, Once I started to give credit where credit was due, I was somehow less envious of them because I knew they had their path and I knew I would get there someday. And, you know, it, yeah, as you said, it's a marathon. And at this point they may be, you know, faster up up ahead, but who knows in 10 years, you know, I may be, I think it's, it's not thinking that it's unfair, but thinking that, you know, things will work out in the end. So sort of being more laid back about it, I think helped me a lot. I love that. And I love the idea that there's a human behind the blogs because, I think we all have done that at some point where we're like, well, my chili recipe is way better than that chili recipe. Well, how do, first of all, how do I know that? And secondly, maybe they were killing it with their chili recipe years ago too. And they draw, you know, you just never know what is going into a story and what's going into a blog post and a recipe. So putting a human element in there is so helpful. And that's been another great thing about networking at conferences for me is putting actual people, matching them to their blogs and seeing that they're really nice and they're really, they're, they're well-meaning and they are passionate as well about this job. 
So there is a human behind every blog. So before you compare Jinju, that was amazing advice. Just know that they're working really hard too. Is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye, Jinju? So much good stuff here. Thank you. Yeah. And so, yeah, about that conferences, I, I just started to go to conferences recently and everything food conference is a great big one for everyone to go to. I recently went to Tastemakers Conference, um, much smaller group. So it has a more intimate feel. Um, so that, that was good also. Um, so find at least a certain group of bloggers that, and make yeah real face to face friends with them. And, and then it turns out later on, if you have any questions that you read from different groups and experts, and you just don't know, like, then you can just message them and ask, have you done this? Does it really work for you? You know, I think that's a, another way to just verify or get help. And I found that to be a great resource too, in addition to having real friends, <laughs> definitely. That is so true. Someone who actually gets you and your real struggles from, definitely. <laughs> from your day-to-day business life. And networking with people at conferences is a great way to go from comparison to actually like cheering for people. Because when you truly have a good blogging friend who you believe puts a ton of hard work and passion into what they're doing, you really root for them and you will do anything. You will, you know, put bag links on your site if it's appropriate and and you will back them in whatever endeavors they're doing, whether it's a cookbook or whatever else. So it's a really good way to change your perspective and just, you know, get kill that comparison trap right. and, and cover it with move a more positive to, uh, feeling. Yeah, like being a cheerleader for people instead of just feeling bogged down in your mind that that you need to be comparing yourself because you really don't. We're the only ones who understand each other too. <laughs> I know. Yes. So true. I mean, we could have a whole other episode about that, how we're just kind of anomalies in this world and (laughs) not very well understood. Yeah. yeah. And at my age, you know, I'm 50 plus. My friends, they totally do not get what food blogging is about. So, yeah, it's it's. uh... Yeah. Not many people. I mean, they're my family. My husband does because he lives with it every day. But my fan, my mom and my dad, they couldn't explain to you what uh-huh. I do. Yeah, they, they all say, is, is that, does that, is that like actual career or what do you do? Uh, do you, yeah. How do yeah. You make money? Do you actually make money? You know, I had someone come to our door the other day. I think he was selling something. I can't even remember, but he asked what I did and I just never know what to say to that question. But I said, I'm a food blogger. And he was like, oh, I totally oh. understand being a food oh. critic. <laughs> And I was like, no, 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 never mind. And I just didn't want to get into it. And he's like, well, do you like go to a restaurant? You know, just, oh, I just stop. I don't, (laughs) I don't want to. I know, but yeah, that's right. You know, for most people, and for me, being a Korean, it's Asian culture, it's even harder to talk to people because, you know, I have a PhD and, and they'll say, what and you're doing food blocking now it's like it's like what a waste you know they they, they will actually oh. say something like that in Korean oh. but it's like oh that's too bad that you had to like oh, <laughs> oh I'm so sorry so, I'm like, yeah you have no idea that's okay you know you do have to have grace with it because you know like why would people know it's it's a newer thing and it's very unique and people don't dive in unless they're actually looking to make it a hobby or a job. So I, over the years, have gained a lot of grace with people. But at first I was like, why don't you understand this? (laughs) But that's just silly. (laughs) Why would they? (laughs) Oh, Jinju, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I am so grateful we had this chat and I'm excited to get this value into the ears of other food bloggers. So thank you. In addition to any everything that you've shared with us, you've shared so much good stuff. Do you have an extra favorite quote or words of inspiration for our fellow food bloggers? Oh, I I think it's just go back to that comparison thing. You know, the comparison is a thief of joy. I think it's a quote that a lot of bloggers know by now. And I didn't know it was by Teddy Roosevelt. But uh, I I think at least for me, that sort of consumed me for a couple of years. And uh, it also made me think whatever I did was never enough. You know, I still need to be there. And, uh, but um, I realized it, 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 you will improve in every post that you put out there, you will get more traffic. 
So we just get there at slower speed, you know, think of the hare and the tortoise, right? We just, we just all need to get there. Uh, we will get there. And also defining success. It's not traffic. It's not money. I kind of redefine my success to be if I make difference in many lives, because actually I have a huge group of Korean adoptees who got adopted uh, into American families after the Korean War, and they are just so thirsty for authentic Korean food and culture. And actually yesterday I was talking in my Facebook group, and so many of them were telling me they feel like I'm their mom that they never had, the Korean mom. Aww. So yesterday I realized, you know what? This is success, right? Uh, yeah. I, I don't care if I can make you know millions of dollars or not, but if I made a difference in at least few people, made them happier, made them you know more connected to their heritage, I somehow, yeah, I'm just so grateful for them and they appreciate me. So it's, it's all good. That is so inspiring. Thank you so much. Just redefining success is so huge. I love that story. Just like knowing what success means to you. If you're making people happy, then that is well <laughs> with my soul I anyway. So. so thank you for sharing that. Well, Jinju has a list of favorite resources relating to everything we talked about today. And these can be found on her show notes page at eatblogtalk.com forward slash Jinju. That's spelled J-I-N-J-O-O. Jinju, tell my listeners the best place to find you online. Uh, online, my recipes, of course, you can find it on kimchi mari, K-I-M-C-H-I-M-A-R-I.com. But otherwise, I'm everywhere. I'm on Instagram, Kimchi Marie Facebook uh, page. And I also have a Korean Food with Kimchi Marie Facebook group. Um, has wonderful group of people who are ready to help you with any questions. A lot of times I, I can't get there fast enough because somebody already helped them. So yeah, find me there. I'm on Pinterest, you know, just everywhere. But I would love to have you try my recipes and give me feedback. And I answer every question that you ask. So um, I hope you visit. Well, awesome. Thank you so much again for being here, Jinju. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.